Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Fabiani, and as Deputy Presiding Officer, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Scottish Parliament and to the grand final of the 2016 Donald Dewar Memorial Debating Tournament. I'm really happy to see some of my MSP colleagues here uh, this evening. We have Willie Rennie and Mark MacDonald, who were on the judging panel. We have Jenny Gilruth, Jamie Hepburn, Liam Kern, Edward Mountain. And if I have missed any MSP colleagues, please feel free to say point of order and correct me. Point of order, Gail Ross is also here, welcome. Now you should have let me know this, Gail. <laughs> I myself have been very, very privileged to have been here since 1999, and so I knew Donald Dewar. So it's a particular pleasure to be chairing this event for the first time in my new role as Deputy Presiding Officer. I've often heard it said that the Dewar debate is a highlight in this Parliament's calendar. Having presided over proceedings in this chamber throughout this week, I'm really looking forward to hearing the arguments and ideas of our younger speakers this evening. And it's great to see our member seats filled with school pupils. You are all very, very welcome. There were 128 teams representing schools from around our country who set out on the road to Holyrood in November last year. 256 pupils for 104 schools entered, and that's more schools than took part in previous years. This year, there were 32 first round heats, 16 second round heats, and four semi-finals. And these have been whittled down to the four very talented teams who will be competing in this evening's grand final. So congratulations to all the finalists who I will introduce shortly, and to the other four schools who will also take up seats on the chamber floor. They will have the opportunity to participate in the open floor debates during the course of the tournament. The competition itself is organised by the Law Society of Scotland, and thank you to everyone at the Society for all of their hard work and effort in this regard. I'd also like to thank the tournament sponsors, Hodder Gibson Publishers and the Glasgow Bar Association for their much valued support. Donald Dewar was Scotland's first First Minister of this Parliament. And Donald died far too early. And the tournament was set up and dedicated to Donald's memory. Donald Dewar was a student of history and law and he practised as a solicitor in between periods of serving as a member of the House of Commons where he represented seats in Aberdeen and then Glasgow. He was a member of the Glasgow Dialectic Society and was a frequent participant in its debates, alongside his contemporaries, many of whom moved into high-profile jobs in politics, law and the media. Donald retained his passion for debating right through his political career in the House of Commons and in the early days of this parliament. In his first speech, in what was then our new Scottish Parliament, Donald said, Today there is a new voice in the land, the voice of a democratic parliament, a voice to shape Scotland, a voice for the future. So it is fitting that occupying the seats of our parliamentarians tonight are those who are potentially the future lawmakers, the politicians and the lawyers. It's also fitting that this chamber continues to reverberate to the sound of a new generation of debaters through this annual competition. And I certainly hope that this experience has a positive and lasting effect on your future. Finally, joining us in the public gallery tonight are many, many proud parents, classmates, cla sorry, classmates and teachers. You are very, very welcome, and it's wonderful to see all of you here. I hope you enjoy your evening here at Holyrood. So, I wish all of the finalists the very best of luck. It wasn't luck that got you here, it was talent. But I wish you luck tonight, and I hope you all have a very enjoyable evening here in your 
Parliament. Thank you very much. Well, let's get down to business. Before we begin, I would like to congratulate the four schools that have made it to the final. They are the Royal High School, Bray's High School, St. Morris's High School, and Nairn Academy. I'd now like to outline the format of the debate. I will call on the first proposition speaker to speak. They have six minutes. I will then call on the first opposition speaker to speak, and they also have six minutes. This is repeated for the second proposition and the second opposition speakers before we open the debate to the floor. During these four speeches, I will verbally announce when the first minute is up, and this will indicate that interventions are now permitted. I will also verbally indicate when you have entered your last minute. At this point, no interventions will be taken. When your six minutes is up, I will ask you to wind up. And if you continue further, I will ask again for you to wind up after 30 seconds. Please remember I am well experienced in keeping my fellow MSPs to time. And there are plenty of clocks around the chamber. So there's no excuses, and I would expect our debaters to observe their time limits. The debate will then be opened up to the floor for a further 15 minutes before we hear the reply speeches from the opposition and proposition. These reply speeches should last no more than three minutes. There will be no interventions, and I will verbally announce when you have entered into your last minute. I would encourage as many of you as possible to participate in the floor debate. And bear in mind that the judges will award a £50 book voucher to the best speaker from the floor over the course of the night. I'd also like to remind the teams that it is entirely your choice if you choose to answer any points raised during the floor debate. And please be aware that your performance will not be judged in the floor debate. The motion for debate is, this house supports the right to be forgotten online. Our presiding judge is John Dye, former chairman of the English Speaking Union in Scotland. John is joined by Mark Macdonald MSP and Willie Rennie MSP, along with Irene McGrath, who is chair of the Scottish Schools International Debating Council, and John Carson former English teacher and debate coach at Craigmount High School in Edinburgh. And they have won this tournament three times. May I now ask Bray's High School and Nairn Academy to leave the debating chamber through the door at the back and we will commence with the first debate. I would like to call on Laura Wood from Royal High School to open the debate as the first proposition speaker. Imagine living in a world where everything about you is documented online for everyone to see forever. Imagine living in a world where Google remembers more about your life than you do. Imagine living in a world where you are haunted by your past mistakes at every turn. Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, Honourable Judges, fellow debaters. For the purposes of this debate, we define a right as a fundamental human entitlement open to all, regardless of any defining characteristic. 
we define forgotten as to lose the remembrance of, and online as anything related to the internet, including social media sites and search engines. We support the fundamental principle of an individual's right to not be remembered online. We believe that if we are represented online in any way, we should be able to exercise the right to remove that information from the internet One minute. as and when we wish. We do acknowledge that if this motion was carried, there would be practicalities surrounding its enforcement. However, we wish to make clear that nowhere in this motion is there a mention of the practicality of introducing and enforcing the right to be forgotten. No, thank you. When Sir Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web in 1989, the world was irreversibly changed for the better, and it's hard to imagine living without it. However, the devil is in the detail, and the internet has a dark side too. We on proposition believe that without the right to be forgotten, we and the information about us are ripe for exploitation, online predators prol proliferate, and our futures can be seriously jeopardised. My colleague Sarah will later touch on the legal implications of this motion. Our fundamental right to privacy is being constantly violated beneath our very noses, and we cannot even smell the rat. The internet megaliths, such as Facebook and Google, diligently inform us that it's for our own good. They watch our every move to improve our browsing experience, to streamline our advertising, and to send us better products. But in reality, our every keystroke is monitored and filed, traded and exchanged. Our online lives, our browsing history, our iPhone location, our health and fitness data, they all come under scrutiny. It is these companies and security agencies and governments who wish to continue the status quo because they can benefit from our information, financially or otherwise. But if we ask the internet experts, the programmers, the investigative journalists, they have the insight to routinely mask their internet activity by using encrypted browsers. These experts are anxious about what the future of the web may hold if we are not granted the right to online anonymity. Through, through whose hands does our property, our personal information pass? It's not just big businesses with ulterior motives. It's individuals with criminal intent, even paedophiles. Yes, please. Not only paedophiles and criminals that are interested in this. It is also companies that wish to um, refresh their image online and look better. As I've already stated, many big companies actually exploit the information about us that is available online. I would like to talk you through a scenario. A pupil takes part in a national debating competition. Their school wants to celebrate this success, so up goes their name and a photograph on the school website. The predator now knows which school this pupil goes to and where they will be at the close of each school day. Where predators may have loitered at school gates in the past, they now linger on school websites. A simple online search leads to the social media profiles of this pupil, and it is extremely hard to say where this will stop. Whilst this is a particularly chilling example, it would be naive of the opposition to suggest that this couldn't happen. Yes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, we can't ignore the fact that the internet allows us to put up information, but if it goes onto the internet, we need to be aware that it is there on the internet for anyone to see. Of course, we're aware that our information is available on the internet for everyone to see, but what we're trying to say is that if we no longer wish it to be present on the internet, we should be allowed to remove it. Offline, in real life, we are the masters of our own identity. We can control what we look like, what we say and how we act. One minute. Online, however, we are left at the mercy of others and how they choose to portray us. Lies, untruths, factual inaccuracies, they all fuel salacious gossip and ignorant comments over which we have no control. Almost half of hiring managers admit that the decision to hire somebody is swayed by their online profiles. No longer there are handshakes or genuine first impressions. We're relying on the portrayal of our friends and acquaintances. If that isn't a terrifying prospect, I don't know what is. 
If we do not pass this motion, there will no longer be a need to imagine. We will be living in a world where everything about us is documented online forever. We will be living in a world where Google remembers more about our lives than we do. We will be living in a world where we are haunted by our past mistakes at every turn. Ladies and gentlemen, for the reasons that I have stated and Sarah will go on to express, Wind up, we beg you to propose this motion. Thank you, Laura. I now call on Adam McGurr from St Morris's High School to respond as the first opposition speaker. Good evening, esteemed judges, deputy presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen. I would firstly like to state that we on the opposition accept the proposition's definition of the motion. As first opposition speaker, I wish to open the case from two main standpoints. First of all, censorship, and second of all, a conflict of interest. My colleague, Mr. Hansen, will then further develop the case for the opposition from three main standpoints. First of all, accountability, second of all, morality, and third of all, practicality. However, let me indulge in some rebuttal. The first proposition speaker stated that we should ignore practicalities as they are not stated in the motion. However, we on the opposition believe they are simply too important to forget as the cost and time implications are very, very important. One minute. Which my colleague will further state. Deputy presiding officer, even if we were to concede that such a concept is desirable, its practical implications render it unworkable. To quote George Orwell, threats to freedom of speech, writing and action, though often trivial in isolation, are cumulative in their effect and, unless checked, lead to a general disrespect for the rights of the citizen. That, ladies and gentlemen, leads me on to my first point. Censorship is a complicated issue. However, everyone must temper sympathy and horror at any perceived infringement of human rights in relation to this motion. This law's squeaky clean exterior cannot be allowed to deceive us. In fact, we could see censorship of massive parts of the web and a restriction on our freedom of information. Although removing the information from a search engine supposedly renders it forgotten, the law forgets the startling exponential growth of the internet. Yes, please. Um, we find in our, um, in our definition of the motion that it was for individuals. This would be personal information, not uh, large facts that would um, hinder the public's knowledge of what is going on in the world. Well, Deputy Presiding Officer, as my partner go on to state, even if you put personal information on social media sites, it is still open to everyone who accesses such sites, and you should be aware of that. It disregards cached versions and web archives, which means the same piece of information can be duplicated and stored in an immense amount of places. So let me ask you this. How far do we go before privacy becomes censorship? On a more important note, however, in the interest of public safety and counter-terrorism, surely the right to know is much more important than the right to be forgotten. Now, despite criteria that should determine the accuracy and relevance of content, this in itself has led to problems, as my colleague will further mention. Moreover, we risk creating an inequality in the ability to access information. The US would never introduce privacy laws as they contradict the First Amendment. This could lead to different experiences of the internet depending on the country you live in, meaning the internet is no longer this global platform so the ideals of it have been fatally undermined. So to conclude my first point, can we truly implement the right to be forgotten online without removing every version of a piece of content? We cannot. Well, thank you. 
Now, on to my second point. The right to be forgotten must not subsume the right to know or remember. We now go back to this old saying, there are two sides to every story. It's quite simple, really. One person may want a piece of content removed, whilst another does not. Those wishing to remove content need to remember that free speech and free media are functional rights of any self-respecting democracy. And regardless of whether people say good things or bad things, content can be set in a historical context. And that would be much more advantageous to those involved, as online information surely is more reliable than human memory. Yes, please. Uh, surely if the individual finds this information that is present online about them harmful to them, it's surely only acceptable that they are able to have this information removed. Madam, One minute. Madam, uh, sorry, Deputy Presiding Officer, that is the thing. If it's on the internet, then it is free to everyone. That is a functional human right. Those accessing the information are truly within their rights to do so, for example, employers, and should they see that one picture of that boisterous night out seven years ago, they know that time can change people and the choices they make. However, we on the opposition do acknowledge that striking that balance between the right to forget and the right to remember is very difficult. And my colleague will further mention this. So, to conclude, the right to be forgotten online will only lead to mass censorship and is actually flawed as the information is still available in a cached version or indeed another country. We must remember that information dated and set in context is arguably more reliable than memory and we all have a right to online content. Wind up please. But overall, we risk a potential restriction on foundational rights of a democratic and civilised society. We on the opposition cannot support a concept that cannot be truly implemented. Therefore, we seek to oppose this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I now invite Sarah Gardner, the second proposition speaker, to give us her views. You can find just about anything online. Name it, give me five seconds and good Wi-Fi, and I'll be able to find and tell you some basic things about whatever it is you've asked me to research. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, yet the deeper you look, the more uncomfortable this cornucopia of information becomes. Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, Honourable Dudges, fellow debaters, my colleague Laura has already spoke of some of the kind of effects that public information can have on the lives of individuals. I shall now go on to expand on the fine line between the right to privacy and freedom of information, how the internet responds to the right to be forgotten, and the impact of this right on society. I shall prove why the right to be forgotten online should undoubtedly be supported, as it is something important to the lives of many, and is something we should all be entitled to. However, I would first like to start with a bit of rebuttal. The opposition believes that if we put something onto the internet, we should um, know that it cannot be taken off and accept that. However, it, is, it isn't minute. just non knowledgeable and uninformed teenagers and adults who put information online. How many times have you seen a Facebook post of a new parent showing off their newborn baby? They may, be, they may upload details such as a date and time of birth, full name and weight. It was not the child who chose to put up this information about them, so why shouldn't they and others be able to remove information like this from public domain. The, pub, uh, the opposition is also concerned that the freedom of information may be compromised should the right to be forgotten online be widely available. And to, give them to, and to give them due credit, the balance between the privacy of an individual and the freedom of information is a delicate one, yet one which is more important to each of our lives than many of us realize. Obviously, Laura and I believe that the freedom of information is essential in the modern world, we are in no way arguing that public information should be hidden away, masked from the eyes of the public, leaving the world with only a small percentage of the facts. We are instead supporting the fundamental right that we as humans have to keep some things to ourselves. To give an example, if asked for the number of heart attack, yes please. If you are keeping it to yourself, then why put it on the internet in the first place? Um, as I already said, um, and as Laura already said, it's not only you who puts up personal information. 
a school website or a parent may put these things up. And if you don't want it there, why shouldn't you have the right to be able to keep it private? No, thank you. Um, to give an example, if asked for the number of heart attack patients treated in the past year, the NHS is obliged to be forthcoming with accurate information. However, it would withhold any personal information such as names and addresses, thus adhering to the Human Rights Act. Article 8 of this states that everyone has the right to respect for private life. This act was passed in the late 1990s, some years prior to the flurry and bombardment of social media that exists in the world today. However, if a, person is in, if a person is entitled to the right of privacy in their own lives offline, to choose and control what stays personal and what is made public, then why shouldn't this be the same online? Laura has mentioned that the internet is, a, is different to real life, a melting pot of, di of different opinions and facts, mingling in a maze of strings of profiles, websites, and blogs. It may be more difficult to get the same level of security with the internet, but the principle itself is the same. The right to have privacy and be forgotten is something we as individuals should be entitled to. Yes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, we go back to that um, point that me and my colleague were stating earlier. Once it's on the internet, it's probably not ever going to come back. And the thing is, if it's out there, you should be aware of the consequences. Um, uh, I will actually come on to this as uh, the right to be forgotten was actually an act already passed by the European Union in 2014 and has been, uh, Google itself has adapted its software to give the users the right to request removal of search results for queries. This is already in place and is already working online to give people an ability to take things offline they find are too personal to be pu made public. No, thank you. A year after this was implemented, Google had received hundreds of thousands of requests, covering almost a million links, which were seen to be irrelevant, outdated, or otherwise inappropriate. Clearly, these vast numbers show that the right to privacy and the ability to be forgotten online is something that is clearly important to many. And the fact that it has already been in use for two years shows that it is something that can work. Cases of removed links have ranged from removing information about false accusations, something which may come up when searching a name after a job interview. And it can also establish a safer online environment for children by removing full names and addresses. Ladies and gentlemen, if scores of people and large corporations also feel that the right to be forgotten online is important, then surely it is something that all should be entitled to. Think to the amount of times One minute. that you have seen an unflattering photo of yourself. Maybe it's just on a friend's camera or phone, or maybe they've put it on the internet for all to see. I'm sure you can relate to that feeling you get when you know that something is public without your permission. And if you're anything like me, you'll try to do whatever it takes to get that photo deleted. I, for one, am not above stealing my sister's phone in order to remove whatever ugly photo it is she's taken of me. However, imagine if this scenario was more extreme, something a lot more personal and public than just a tweet of a silly photo. Less than a month ago, a teenage girl committed suicide by jumping in front of a train in Paris. This incident itself is heartbreaking enough. Yet what makes it worse is that her death was live streamed on a social media site to over 1,000 viewers. This video is still being watched like Saturday Night Entertainment, yet the right to be forgotten online would allow the family to move past this tragedy, knowing that their daughter's death is no longer being replayed by strangers. Therefore, for a safer life both on and offline and for the internet to become a place where Wind we feel up, secure, please. we beg you to support the motion. Thank you, Sarah. I now call Paul Hansen, second opposition speaker, to speak. Deputy Presiding Officer, as second speaker for the opposition, I wish to further develop the case my colleague, Mr McGurr, has previously made. I intend, to, I intend to do this through three main standpoints. Accountability, morality, and finally, practicality. However, first of all, some rebuttal from myself. I can't quite believe what I am hearing from the proposition team this evening. If you put the information on the internet in the first place, then you must accept that it is there for anyone to see. So you must take responsibility online and act sensibly. They say it is a right to be forgotten. 
But you cannot have a right without a solid bedrock for it to rest upon. Otherwise, it will be nothing but dysfunctional. And the proposition said that this is for individual cases, not large pieces of information. One minute. But who is it to pick, but who, but who is it up to, to pick and choose what is appropriate for review? So thank you. Finally, the point they continuously make about schools is invalid, as schools ask for your permission and checks are rigorous and thorough. Deputy Presiding Officer, let us look at the thorny issue of accountability. We are all human and we all make mistakes. But should our mistakes be removed from the internet or remain there to learn from? If you are on the web, then you acknowledge that every tweet you make or Facebook post you like is there for all the world to see. And there really is no shawl of privacy online. The minute, no, the second we engage in social media, we accept that we actively give up our right to privacy. And we all know this. This is why there are age restrictions on such sites. Furthermore, we live in a society where we rely heavily on websites and social media to access information on a daily basis, whether it is to read a review of a nearby restaurant or do background checks on the person we are meeting at that restaurant, just to make sure they're as good looking as their Tinder photo suggests. Let's face it, folks, we've all been there. <laughs> However, with the right to be forgotten online, already implemented in the EU, it could be difficult to find out who it is exactly you are meeting online. Let me give you an example of a removal request that was approved. A man requested the removal of a link to a news summary of a local magistrate's decision that included the man's guilty verdict, and this was made inaccessible. As my colleague has mentioned, it is impossible to strike a balance between the right to remember and the right to forget. My second point is that we must consider the moral implications of this legislation. My colleague has already raised the issue that the systems used to either approve or deny applications are not operated by machines, but rather faceless bureaucrats who decide whether or not a case is just cause for removal. Applications are made to Google and many other search engines that operate as private bodies and are not obliged to adhere to the same principles as a public body would. Thus, we surrender control to these organisations. And let us remember that this process is a case-by-case -case basis, and each individual case needs to be reviewed. Therefore, the right to be forgotten online is decided by an unknown, unaccountable body. So how do we know this right is being implemented fairly and does not compromise the rights of others? Which brings me on to my final point of this evening. All of us must take into consideration the practicalities, or impracticalities, should I say, of the right to be forgotten online. Many questions remain. How much will this cost? And more importantly, who will pay for it? How many people will need to be employed to create this potentially sinister workforce? And let me ask you this. Why is it even called the right to be forgotten when one can never truly make other people forget? One minute. Overall, ladies and gentlemen, it is perfectly safe to assume that the right to be forgotten online is an unwanted intrusion that will stifle free speech. There is no possible means of deleting all links to content, and it is preposterous to think that people in the US and other countries could freely access sites unavailable to EU citizens, therefore shattering the strong unilateral connection we have with the world thanks to the internet. It begs the question, Deputy Presiding Officer, whose right is it 
to decide what is forgotten online and who does not deserve to remember. Hence, for all the reasons previously mentioned, we seek to oppose this motion. Thank Wind you. up, please. Thank you, Paul, and thank you to all the speakers. I will now open this debate to the floor, and the floor debate will last for 15 minutes. I will invite speakers from the floor to raise points in relation to the debate. If you wish to speak, please remain in your seat and raise your hand. If selected, you should wait for the red light to come on on your microphone, like this one here. You should stand, tell the chamber your name and the name of your school before you raise your point. And can I say to my MSP colleagues, I don't want to see any of your hands <laughs> raised. You do enough talking in here. Contributions should be short. And again, I would ask my colleagues to listen to that instruction and see how well it's taken. Now, teams can choose to respond to the point, but their performance is not judged against the response. Teams can simply concentrate on constructing their reply speech, which is marked. There will be a prize of a £50 book token, as I said earlier, for the best floor speech of the night. Now, may I ask our timekeeper to start the clock, please, for 15 minutes and invite hands raised. Now, can I tell you, if I don't see one, I'll just pick somebody. Ah, straight in ahead of me, the young gentleman with the white shirt. Um, good um, evening, members of the chamber. I am Matthew McVeigh and I'm from Nairn Academy. I would just like to put a point across to the proposition. Um, Ms Wood, um, you mentioned that online predators can access information, say, from schools that put information on. Um, however, there is, a, there is a letter sent home for consent um, if going on, for example, this trip, um, all four members of the people that have come with us were given consent letters. These were signed and also asked if photos could go online. I forgot to turn my microphone on. The gentleman right behind the first speaker. Yep. Alex from Vora High School. Uh, that goes back to the point that Laura made about it being other people who can put things online, friends, acquaintances, parents. And with those consent letters, it's actually your parents who sign them, not you. So if you don't have, if you've not put something up, surely you should have the right to take it down. Right, we have a real shortage of young ladies. Aha! Ahead, slightly to my right, the young lady with the red tie. Good evening, everyone. I would like to ask a question to the proposition side. As you previously stated, criminals and paedophiles may use social media and things that we have posted to find people, but did you not take into consideration that it can also be used to find the criminals? Social media has opened a door for the police to find people in investigations for things like murders. Thank you. May I ask what your name is, please? I'm sorry. Amy Hislop from Breeze High School. Thank you. Now, we have some people over on the left here. We have two lads with the nice green blazers sitting together. So the one on my left first, and then the next door neighbour. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a point to the proposition again, although it's a point that's not really been brought up, I think it was touched on by the opposition. Um, you're talking about the right to be forgotten, but surely such a right could become severely counterintuitive with people choosing to actually abuse this. Uh, maybe in an attempt to silence dangerous ideas, maybe during a the reign of a, di a dictator, or as a means for criminals to actually uh, remove potential evidence of wrongdoings and thus attempt to evade the law. And can I have your name, please? Sorry. Uh, Chris McCarthy in St Aloysius. Thank you, Chris. And the young man beside you. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Burns, St Aloysius College. 
and it's a point to the proposition, just to say that throughout history, people have reconstructed their image um, for both personal and political gain. A prime example, of course, being the current leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, who has reconstructed his image in the eyes of the public, his own public, um, in an attempt to make himself appear a prescient and generous politician, something which we know he is not. So I would ask the proposition, um, by allowing individuals to modify uh, their online image as presented by both themselves and others, is it not simply opening up a new and more easily accessible medium by which people may abuse power? The young lady straight behind. Thank you. Um, Sarah Letters, Talavish's College. The point I would like to make is towards the proposition. Um, I would like to make my point about social networking and education. Um, as it has been mentioned, many businesses and universities have admitted to looking up the profiles online of many applicants. Yet, I shall say that there are many things online we aren't exactly proud of. For example, that photo from 2010 that does make you look slightly psychotic. However, I seriously doubt something, a lone incident such as that, will make much of a difference in your application. However, there are slightly more serious things that might actually be shown online, such as, for example, all those nights that you went out drinking underage and those clubs you went into with your forged ID. These are things that aren't exactly mentioned on a UCAS application or your CV, something that can be easily hidden from that, but can't be hidden from your online profile. So instead of being this model citizen that you paint yourself to be, you're actually somebody who could be slightly unreliable. And what university or business is going to spend, for example, in the case of applying for medicine, £200,000 on an individual who may not complete their course due to going out at night drunk or showing up to lectures completely unable to concentrate due to their hangover? Thank you. With your name and your school, please. Uh, my name is Julie Muller, I'm from the Royal High. In rebuttal to that point, your, the universities do not take in, they don't, they don't, you don't have your degree and your diploma online. You can't modify that. The universities send it up when you apply for, say, medical school. So the point you're making is not necessarily true because it's not online. It's they've got it in paper and they, you can't modify that. Gentlemen, white shirt sleeves. Hello, I'm McLeod from St Aloysius College. My point is, um, my point's to the proposition. The proposition made the point that by deleting information, um, personal information that's embarrassing, could be good for the person. Well, this can be counterintuitive because, as we've seen in the recent court case in England of celebrities' personal lives, this can actually go back to haunt them by making people more eager to go and find this information and can have a negative effect. Thank you. I've had a lot of comments with proposition, so Sarah will respond. Can I just start from, like... Um, to reply to your comment, um, I think that having people's personal lives taken offline and choosing to make them private shouldn't necessarily make it more dangerous for them online. If someone wants to hide some away, something away, lock it away in a safe, that doesn't necessarily make people more likely to want to go and attack that um, safe, because they've made it safe. Um, to address the point made about university applications, a, a, a university application won't show the full uh, spectrum of what a person is like in their personality, whether they have been done mean things offline or online. It can still be hidden. Um, being online just makes it easier to find. And um, the way that the Google allows people to take things off the internet to have the right to be forgotten is only for specific reasons. Only uh, a small percentage of these are actually taken off rather than something that would not be, um, if only if it harms the person, 
rather than if it were to um, be irrelevant. The young man to my left. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. My name is Adam McElroy. I'm from St Maurice's High School. Now, for me, I think this issue lies in the shadow of perhaps a bigger issue. The old traditional battle between uh, big businesses and individuals. I th if you think about the amount of information online and the amount of information that businesses have to manipulate your decisions, to force adverts your way, to almost socially condition you to buy their goods or take their service, it's almost, in my opinion, immoral. And I think that we as young people uh, have the opportunity to define a generation and to take control away uh, from these big businesses and put it back into the hands of elected and accountable officials in the state. And I think fundamentally this motion lies at the heart of it because it's about what information we as individuals are allowed to say, hang on a minute, we've got control over that and we can take them out of the public light if we want to, away from the hands and clutches of the big businesses. So, like I said, I think this is a defining moment for us and it can be a defining motion for our generation as well. Thank you very much. Young lady, straight in front with the red tie. Hello, my name is Natasha Watson and I'm from Bruce High School. I would like to give a comment towards the proposition. In recent events, are you aware that terrorists have been using social media to spread messages to each other? By giving them the right to forget, we are letting them get away without being arrested by leaving no trace behind after they've deleted any account of, or any information about themselves. Young lady slightly to my left with the, the lovely purple uniform. Hi, I'm Carrie Cusick from St Peter the Apostle. This is for the opposition. You mentioned earlier how it might not work very well if it was from like different countries having different amount of information. But in the recent court case in um, England, it was blocked, but here it wasn't, and we were able to get the information, and it worked fine. Um, I was wondering how that would work like for the other ones. Yes, the chap just up to my left. Uh, Alistair Lockhart, St Alish's College. The opposition have mentioned how freedom of speech and free universal access to the internet are important uh, factors of a free and democratic society. But surely they agree that uh, personal privacy, especially on the internet where so much of your personal data is online, is just as important to a free and democratic society and so must also be protected. Young gentleman to my right. Thanks, I'm Ross Whitney Hunter from the Royal High School. Uh, I've got a question for the opposition. You mentioned, the second opposition mentioned that leaving things on the internet would allow you to learn from your mistakes, but surely the original purpose of the internet was not to learn from mistakes, but it was to fulfill the wishes of users of the internet, which wouldn't want mistakes in the first place. Paul, you would like to respond? Yeah, our whole point was that we don't make the mistakes and put them on the internet in the first place. Um, and just go back, go back to this man's uh, point over here. Um, it was, oh, I've kind of forgot it now. <laughs> it was on top of my mind. Um, no, social media. Social media. Social media. What was that? Yes, uh, it, um, we have a right to protect um, our social media accounts, and when we use these. Um, you were mentioning that it is an essential part of democracy to have our, our freedom of speech uh, recognised, but surely our freedom of speech should be used sensibly. And what we are putting on the internet, we should always um, make sure that it is responsible and mature. Young lady to my right. Hi, this is Ailish McLean for the opposition. Um, there was an example of a young girl who recently had a video post of her online of her having her head shaved as punishment from her parents. Uh, the video received a lot of backlash and had thousands of shares. And later, a week later, I think she actually committed suicide. But how can this be deemed acceptable uh, as she was deprived of the right to have, to be forgotten online and it ended up leading to extreme circumstances? The young man to my left. Hello, Ewan Snedden from Braid High School. It was a point for the proposition. How do you suggest this motion would come into effect? Because I never felt like you touched on it in your speech. 
Yes, Sarah? Um, we believe that the motion, um, this House supports the right to be forgotten online, did not touch on the practicalities for this. And we feel that um, we did not need to cover this as we were simply talking about the fundamental right that we have to privacy, which is in the Human Rights Act, um, rather than how this would come about. Well, quickly, turn up my left. Um, it's just that many would say the internet is our gift to future generations. Never before have we seen such a compilation of historical evidence from everyday life. And um, to allow the desecration of a historical monument would be seen as abhorrent. Why should we allow people to remove evidence from this? Yes, and we shall end, I think. Our last speaker was also our first contributor from the floor speeches. Um, it was just a point in response to what you had said um, about the girl having her head, her head shaved as a punishment from her parents. Um, although this is, and I'm pretty sure everybody in the chamber will agree with me, a devastating thing, if I may flip it on its head and bring back to the shaving of heads for Cancer Research UK and for various different other points, um, charities rather, um, this was something that was used as a fundraiser um, and that can be remembered, and if employers go on and see this, they will see that people have made this effort to try and do some good for the future of other people. Three, two, one, and our 15 minutes is up. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much for your contributions, and I would now ask Adam McGurr to reply on behalf of the opposition. Adam, you have three minutes. Good evening once again, esteemed judges, deputy presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen. We believe that tonight the opposition has proved that such a motion is actually flawed. We believe the implication of the motion is actually not possible. I wish to focus on two points of clash that I noticed in tonight's debate. First of all, the moral implications of this motion and also the practical implications of this motion. So first of all, Deputy Presiding Officer, the moral implications. The proposition stated that it is down to the individual to choose whether to remove a piece of content or not. Whilst they stated that sometimes it's not their fault that such content finds its way onto the web. I believe there was a point also mentioned by the gentleman over there of schools taking photographs. But of course, as it's been said, uh, well, our school anyway, definitely issue a letter asking for permission whether you wish to take a photograph or not. So we on the opposition believe that the internet, of course, is a great thing. It allows international connection to loved ones and buying a new shirt in seconds. But it is also a predator. We on the opposition believe the use of the internet is a case of individual responsibility. As my colleague stated, the second you commit to social media, you almost forfeit the right to privacy. That picture or post can be stored in such a large amount of places. Unfortunately, due to this, problems can arise. Yet the individual must be aware of the power of social media and therefore the consequences. Now One on to the minute. second point of clash and that was the practical implications of the motion. It was stated by the proposition that the practical implications of this motion can be forgotten, unintentional pun. So let's define what we mean by practicalities. The cost and time implications are among the most important. Should every version of content be removed, the amount of money needed to do such a thing would be massive. Moreover, the time taken to do this research into the number of cases would also be very long. So we have to ask ourselves this, ladies and gentlemen, is it really a worthwhile endeavor? As I mentioned, human memory, although of course can fade over time, will never abolish such thoughts. So therefore, 
Can we truly implement a right to be forgotten? And of course, I go back to George Orwell. Do we introduce the thought, please? Wind up, please. Therefore, for the reasons I have stated, and also the reasons my colleague Mr Hansen has stated, we seek, and also, also hope you will seek, to oppose tonight's motion. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I would now ask Laura Wood to reply for the proposition. You have three minutes, Laura. Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, Honourable Judges, fellow debaters. This evening, the motion, this House supports the right to be forgotten online, has been debated. You have heard from side opposition that the right to know is more important than the right to be forgotten. However, I will highlight to you the main points of clash in this debate and demonstrate that we, side proposition, have proven conclusively that the right to be forgotten online is thoroughly deserved. I would like to start by saying that the opposition actually accepted our definition of the right to be forgotten, including the fact that the practicalities were in no way part of this motion. Therefore, their points against the practicalities about the practicalities cannot be seen as relevant. The opposition also posed us with a question. Whose right is it that our information is removed from the internet? I'm going to answer it. What we have consistently said throughout this debate is that it is the right of the individual who on many occasions will not have complete control over the information concerning them. As they said, the right to know is more important than the right to be forgotten. But what if this knowledge is of, is of extreme privacy to that individual, such as health data or their location tracked by a phone? This is definitely not for the world to know. So it is most definitely down to the individual as to which information about them is present online. As well as this, Article 8 of the Human Rights Act states that we all have the right to have our private lives respected. The opposition mentioned a conflict of interest. On the internet, everything we post or that is present about us is free to everyone. But as we have said, what if this individual has not given permission? Indeed, it may be from a boisterous night out seven years ago, but what if this impedes their future? The opposition also mentioned that the guilty verdict of a man was removed from, removed from the internet at, at his request. But Google's ability to remove unwanted links from search engines is actually policed, and they only remove around 40 to 60% of the requested links. Andy Warhol once said that we would all be famous for 15 minutes. But what if we turned this on its head? What if I told you, ladies and gentlemen, that for only 15 minutes, you could be anonymous? We beg you to propose this motion. I would like to thank both teams and all of those who contributed to this debate. We've heard some very interesting contributions and I hope you all enjoyed participating. We will now have a short break and uh, please speak to one of our events assistants should you wish to make use of the facilities. And during the break, could I please ask the speakers from Royal High School and St. Morris's High School to move back to your seats in the row behind and we can then welcome back Bray's High School and Nairn Academy for the second debate. Please may I ask everyone to be seated ready to commence absolutely promptly at 7.45 p.m. Welcome back. Before we start the second debate, I would like to remind everyone of the motion. This House supports the right to be forgotten online. I would call Ross Heenan from Bray's High School to open the second debate as the first proposition speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, judges and deputy presiding officer, my name is Ross Heenan and this is Andrew Buchan and today we'll be supporting the motion, this house supports the right to be forgotten online. 
as the first speaker of the proposition, it falls to me to define the motion. Now, firstly, under current European law, the right to be forgotten online is defined as the following. People have the right to ask for personal information to be removed, and this applies as long as the information is inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant, or excessive. These are not my words, but the words of the European Parliament, which this year, in April, approved tougher laws to support a right to be forgotten online. Now, we're not for one minute claiming that we should delete knowledge of historic events or criminal convictions or vital information. This is about ordinary people, like you and I, having the right to decide what information is shared about them online. Now, we side proposition agree that currently it's almost impossible to actually resolve this issue entirely. But what we need to be clear on is that this motion builds a foundation for a better future. It's also vital that we make clear the difference between being forgotten and being remembered. We're not asking people to wipe their minds, and we're well aware that things will always be remembered. But this is about taking the internet to task about what it allows to remain. Tonight I'll be exploring our human right to privacy, the dangers of having information available at the touch of a button, and the advancement of technology and content found online. My partner Andrew will extend this argument further and explore the need for balance and drive down into the complexities of the issue and how it affects us. So I'll start off with privacy. So let's begin with a question, the question, why is it a right to be forgotten online? Well, it may seem like a glib answer, but the matter of fact is, it's our human right. Article 8 of the Human Rights Act, not me, not Andrew, states that everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. And I think the last word of that sentence is what's important, correspondence. Because for me, that covers the internet as we use it to communicate. Yes. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do believe that right is caveated by the idea that this right should not be extended to those who pose a risk to national security. How can you prove by allowing people, any people, to remove things from the internet that they do not pose a risk to our national security? When we are let people remove anything from the internet, as what's already in the law actually prevents this. Um, and it says that the people who, oh, let me just find it, um, if it's likely to impede against, if it's irrelevant or if it's dangerous to the public, it is not allowed to be erased from online. And this is what's been passed in the European Parliament and it's the law and it's the fact. And, and so people who are dangerous or criminal won't be allowed to take things offline. So <clears throat> gone are the days of writing letters and filling out forms and waiting in the bank queue to apply for a credit card. All of this now happens online. And just because we embrace that social development does not mean that our right to privacy should be eroded. Every single person in this room listening to what I'm saying can relate to this. We all have aspects of our life we want to keep private. The job we applied for that we didn't get, the blank loan you were rejected for, the relationships that have crumbled. For Andrew and I, the refusal to accept the right to be forgotten online, no thank you is a slap in the face for not only our right to privacy, but also our basic rights as a human being. Embracing the right to be forgotten allows us to build a fairer future where the human right to privacy is paramount. Yes, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, how can you equate uh, a brighter future with one that centres our own history? Sorry, can you repeat that? I lost it. How can you equate... Deputy Presiding Officer, sorry. How can you equate a, history, a future that is better with all, for all of us with one that helps us to censor our own history? It won't allow us to censor our own history, as I've already talked about the law. The law, the Data Protective Directive, which was passed in the EU, says, it says this exactly. Um, data that <coughs> uh, is granted in accordance with Article 89, insofar the right to erasure is likely to impede the achievements of the objectives of archiving of public interest, scientific, historic or statistical research purposes. And I've, I've made a bit of a meal of that there, but what it means is anything historic, anything scientific will not be allowed to be taken off the internet. So you could argue that it's dangerous to allow all information to remain on the internet. We're entering into an age where our lives, particularly young people's lives, are publicised online for everyone to see. Ask any young person, vulnerable or otherwise, if they engage with social media on any level, and I think you know what the answer would be. But this doesn't just impact the most vulnerable, it impacts all of us. Because whether we like it or not, we all live online. If information remains online and people have no control over whether it is deleted or removed, then it opens the floodgates for dangerous people, governments or organisations, no thank you, to use that information against us for... One a, minute. Uh, <clears throat> more information even allows profiling. Can you imagine what Hitler would have done if he'd had access to years worth of Facebook pages? 
Now, to conclude, privacy is a fundamental human right recognised by the UN. In an age of rapid advancements in technology and media, it's quickly become one of the most important human rights of the modern age, serving not only to protect us from unwelcome onlookers, but also to allow us to believe in and associate with whatever we choose without fear of discrimination or judgment. However, as the world around us continues to advance at such an alarming rate, it grows increasingly difficult to protect this right. With the rapid advancement of the internet and the plethora of activities it now caters to, our basic right to privacy is threatened now more than it has ever been. Our lives are documented not on paper, but in the tap of buttons on a keyboard. However, we still retain the most fundamental of rights, the right to privacy regardless. The right to be forgotten is, Wind up, please. is not an article to allow propaganda to be spread and to crush free speech as the opposition would have you believe. No, the right to be forgotten is simply an attempt to protect and uphold our right to privacy, by allowing us to ask for that which concerns us to be removed from the internet. I urge you to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, we will now have Caitlin Sherritt from Nairn Academy to respond as the first opposition speaker. Six minutes, Caitlin. Ladies and gentlemen, judges, Deputy Presiding Officer. Andy Warhol told us in 1968 that we'd all be world famous for 15 minutes. Little did he know how accurate that claim would be some 50 years later. The internet, and particularly social media, have afforded us a platform where every detail of our invariably trivial lives can be published for all the world to see. Fame or sadly infamy authored by our own hand, well, be careful what you wish for. Mr Heenan proposes that this House supports the right to be forgotten online, but I'm afraid I must challenge his interpretation of tonight's motion. He assures us that his right to online on amnesia will only be an option for Joe Public. It will not be a route for the rich, famous and powerful. Well, I wish I could share his innocent optimism. It will be our melancholy pleasure to highlight to him the legal impossibility of such a vague wish. As the opposition will illustrate, censorship, because that's what the, the proposition is proposing, whether they care to admit it or not, is like death and marriage, not something you can enter One into minute. lightly. I contend that this motion tonight only offers a right to those who wish to manipulate and suppress the past, not just their own past, but our past as well. Mr Heenan's desire, sorry, his right to be forgotten online is his naively understandable wish. He offers us carefully selective tales of innocent misunderstandings to, ju to justify his civil liberty crushing stance. Because ultimately that is where this motion leads us, ladies and gentlemen, a backdoor route to, at best, legal confusion. Or at worst, the first steps to a slippery slope, to restrictions on our free speech, and ultimately, as I said, the censorship of the internet. It is my pleasure to frame the opposition to t tonight's motion. Yes, please. Again, you're suggesting that what we're talking about is a complete censorship of the internet, but as Ross has rightly pointed out, we are simply dealing in the facts. Indeed, Article 89, Part 1 of the Data Protection Directive specifically states that stuff can only be removed from the internet so long as it does not impede the achievements of the objectives of archiving and the public interest or scientific, historical, or statistical research purposes. Are you completely failing to understand the law here? Deputy Presiding Officer, again, I'd like to uh, highlight the proposition's naivety if they think that the rich and powerful in this world will not want to take advantage of this ruling. Of course, setting out a motion like this, would have to, you would have to take into account that you, you wouldn't be able to take out historically important things. However, I would question who, who has the right to choose this, and clearly this opens a slippery slope. Once you let one person try this, everyone will want to go. As I said, it is my pleasure to frame the opposition's rep response to tonight's motion. I will explore the complex issues surrounding the dichotomy of the right to privacy when it stands in opposition against the right of freedom of expression. My colleague Finley Almond will consider the impact of this motion in the context of corruption and power. Ladies and gentlemen, my task here tonight is not to persuade you that the internet is perfect the way it is. Far from it. It is to convince you that the attempts of the proposition and the EU to allow citizens to forget their pasts is as impossible to manage as it is sinisterly unwelcome. I do appreciate where Mr Keenan is coming from. I'm human too. The emotional rationale that lies behind the right to be forgotten is powerful and it is understandable. Sadly, all people on this planet have made mistakes. Will we forever be defined by that one mistake that we made that ended up in the internet or on the press? Only if we passively let it. 
We can shape our own footprint on the internet through Google Plus and positive social media engagement. We can take ownership of our history and not be a passive victim to it. Deputy Presiding Officer, as I've already indicated, the main problem, no matter how Mr Heenan tries to rationalise it, is that the right to be forgotten is a form of censorship, despite tonight's interjections. By suppressing true information, let's be very clear, that is what we are talking about here. We are talking about the suppression of true information, not libel, not defamation, not hate speech. By supporting this, we are restricting free access to communication. Yes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, surely the opposition fails to consider that it's, uh, people are allowed to be different at different points of their lives. If I make a mistake at this age, in the future, it will impede me uh, trying to get a job, trying to get a career. People at different points of their life are different. And so to say that it's suppressing true information, it might have been true now, but it won't be true when I'm 40, when I'm 50, when I'm trying to do different things. So how can you say that? Well, Deputy Presiding Officer, first of all, um, surely the proposition must realise that anyone trying to hide any information from themselves on the internet um, must surely come under some kind of censorship of the press, which is clearly against our freedom of speech. However, the main point that I'd like to address there is that the, in real life, we do not have the option to just wipe clean our memories. And we must consider that the internet is an extension of real life, not, not some kind of fantasy world. We must remember that despite what the proposition would like us to believe, we have to take accountability for our own actions, no matter what age we are. Mr Heenan, I'm sure you'll agree with me that I do not have the right to control what you remember. And similarly, I do not have the One right minute. to control what you say. And so for that reason, we must treat the right to be forgotten as a form of extraneous control, as I have said, as a form of censorship. Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, as I have shown you, tonight's motion is not simply about signing up to the latest EU diktat on privacy. And it's not about casting up the spectre of Google as some kind of passive aggressive digital conscience. And Mr. Heenan wishes to be forgotten online. And tonight, I ask him and you why. The answer? We would seek to expunge ourselves from history, as we have heard, if we regretted our past actions, but more worryingly, if we actually had something to hide. I'm not comfortable with a control-alts elite society because it is censorship, no matter how you try to dress it up. It is a crude attempt to suppress history, irrespective of your perhaps good intentions. And in the hands of the corrupt, the consequences are devastating. Mr. Heenan seems to have learned nothing from the lessons of history. Wind or has he simply forgotten how the powerful and ruthless seek to airbrush themselves from their dubious past? Please re take responsibility for your actions and join me in opposing tonight's motion. Thank you, Caitlin. I now invite Andrew Buchan, second proposition speaker, to give us his views. Ladies and gentlemen, judges, deputy presiding officer. My name is Andrew Buchan, and it falls on me to continue the case for side proposition here this evening. Now, my rebuttal will be mixed in throughout my speech, so I'm going to go straight into my first point, which is to talk about what can actually be forgotten online. Now, as Ross explained in his opening, in order to remove any information from the internet, it must be deemed irrelevant or unnecessary to the wider public. Yet our opposition continue to argue that once something is online, it must remain there unless required to be taken down for a legal reason. We simply do not believe this to be the case. People may wish something removed for moral or ethical reasons. If we look at some of the recent removal requests approved by Google, they included patient medical histories, intimate private photos, old threads and group co conversations which ended up online. They included prominent reminders that someone was a victim of rape, assault, or other criminal acts, that they were once an incidental witness to tragedy, One minute. that someone close to them, a partner or a child, was murdered. Our opposition choose to focus here this evening on the extreme ideas and interpretations of this motion, which do not have a tangible bearing on the world we exist within. No thank you. The importance and significance of this motion lies on its impact on the everyday people like you and I. Let us not forget where this right developed from. It didn't come from the rich and famous or massive corporations trying to crush their opposition, like the opposition would have you believe. It came into place because Spaniard Mario Gonzalez demanded his contact information and reminders of a previous debt be removed from the internet because it was long since outdated, yes. Deputy Presiding Officer, Senor Gonzalez was a banker who went bankrupt. Do you really think his clients don't deserve to know that they're getting financial advice from a bankrupt? I don't think that uh, Spaniard Mario Gonzalez's clients deserve to know 
his phone number from when he tried to sell his house. Does forcing this information to remain online actually improve our society in any way, ladies and gentlemen? The simple answer, no, of course it doesn't. It's time we allow the past to be forgotten so we can move forward and build for a better future. No, thank you. Which moves me on to my next point about the effect this motion has on our legal system. In the UK, we pride ourselves on our legal system, on the fact we offer everyone a fair trial and the right to prove their innocence. In this country, you are innocent until proven guilty. Yet online, you are guilty even once proven innocent. No, thank you. We claim to offer a fair trial which only punishes the guilty. Yet during and even after a defendant proves their innocence, they continue to be reminded of the crime they did not commit, having it loom over their lives. The case of actor and television presenter Matthew Kelly is quite frankly tragic. Not only did he have to tra face a trial by the media over accusations he was a paedophile, even once these accusations were shown to be completely false, he was never allowed to forget this traumatic experience because the internet never forgets, yes. Deputy Residing Officer, I'm afraid what the Speaker is proposing here is that we censor what the free press of our country are allowed to report. Whatever you say, that is what you are proposing. Not even slightly. What I'm saying is that the, the press can say that at the time, but once he has been proven innocent, why should he continue to be reminded of something which is completely false about himself? The thing is, we are well aware on side proposition that you will remember an incident or experience like this. But as Ross stated, the internet is a virus, and it means that there are constant reminders, even once this aspect of your life is no longer relevant. Rather distressingly, ladies and gentlemen, if you Google Matthew Kelly pedophile, the results are humiliating character assassinations. In fact, the third option under his name is a website solely de dedicated to Matthew Kelly pedophile jokes. How can this man ever be allowed to move on while the internet will not let him and others forget? No, thank you. The case of Mr. Kelly is not an isolated one. Many others are undergoing and continue to undergo experiences just like his. Now, it might not seem like a topical reference, and you might crow that this happened 13 years ago, but that is our very point on side proposition. This did happen 13 years ago, but due to the internet and the lack of the right to be forgotten, he was never allowed to move on. And I guess that leads me on to my third and final point here this evening, that this motion affects all of us. It affects every single person in this building. The internet is, as we mentioned, a virus. It has taken over our lives. One minute. And we seem to ignore this fact. All of you will have used the internet. You bank online, you get a passport online, you shop online, you maintain friendships online. This very event was organized online. And your information is out there, whether you like it or not, but you do not have control. That is what the right to be forgotten is about, ladies and gentlemen. It isn't about rewriting history like the opposition would have you believe. It's about taking control of our digital lives whether that be the removal of an embarrassing photo posted by a friend or personal information uploaded to secure a mortgage, we do not believe such aspects of our lives must be documented for the rest of history. Ladies and gentlemen, Ross and I have both stated that the internet is a virus and the new right is a cure. Will it fix it overnight? No. But with time, we can build a better world. This motion is not about today, ladies and gentlemen. It's about tomorrow. So I will simply Wind leave up, you to consider what, what sort of world we want to leave for future generations. One where a mistake when we were childish and foolish haunts us for the rest of our life, or one where a mistake is just that, a moment in our life that we regret. And it's for these reasons that we urge you to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, can I now ask Finlay Almond, second opposition speaker, to speak? Finlay. Deputy Presiding Officer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Buchan and Mr. Heenan have proposed that this House supports the right to be forgotten online, and this is sadly reflective of today's superficial society. We want the right to forget our transgressions without the burden of remembering the consequences. In short, we want all of the freedom but none of the responsibility. 
As Caitlin has outlined, and despite Mr Buchan's spluttering interjections, this motion leads to a world where the internet will be effectively censored. Now, before I go on to illustrate how this is perilously close to reality already, I would like to consider some key points of clash that are evident in tonight's debate. Both Mr Buchan and Mr Heenan unsurprisingly choose to align themselves with the poor and maligned victims of spurious internet falsehood. And their fears are natural. But this is a proposition which plays into the hands of the privileged, the powerful, the rich, and the corrupt. We, on the opposition, we want to One access minute. to a history that is not being manipulated by invisible puppet masters who choose what we must forget. People have every right to suppress unpleasant lies, lies that are publicised about them. And this is why the UK Defamation Acts of 1952, 1996 and 2013 already exist. But this right does not extend to the compulsory forgetting of inconvenient truths. Now, unsurprisingly, Mr Heenan takes exception to this. But his point that this will only be used by society's victims, whilst well-intentioned, is about as credible as the aforementioned Senor Gonzalez's attempts to balance his finances. Deputy Presiding Officer, the European Court of Justice ruling C-131-12 upheld the notion of citizens' rights to be forgotten online. And let's be honest, who wouldn't want to be able to airbrush their past? Why should a few drunken student photographs or preclude people's solemn applications to become accountants or nuns or cabinet ministers. But crucially, as we've heard, the EU didn't order that these unflattering truths had to actually be deleted. Yes, please? That is pretty much what we're arguing, ladies and gentlemen. Why should a past tr tr transgression, whilst we were young, whilst we weren't thinking straightly, be the thing that looms over us and stops us from ever being able to move on and achieve our goals and aspirations. It is completely ludicrous to suggest that what we did when we were young is a complete reflection on our life to date. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Speaker has just stood up and said that the democratic will of the people of Scotland do not have a right to know about the people that they are electing to make decisions on their behalf. This EU ruling has suggested that search engines should just provide links and stop providing them this making facts harder, not impossible to find, and certainly not forgotten. Deputy Presiding Officer, allow me to highlight the potential for the abuse of this motion. Mr Heenan and Mr Buchan have gone to great lengths to highlight that the right to be forgotten is not, we are told, a tool for the rich and the powerful to further insulate themselves from justice and truth. Now, I direct the audience toward the recent activity of PayPal billionaire Peter Thiel, currently donating millions to a variety of court cases where people are suing mainstream media outlets, making it his mission to support the common man in their fight for privacy. What a philanthropist hero, I see you say. But his true motivation is to crush any commentary that he disagrees with. Rich person finds way to abuse power and manipulate our freedom. This is how it starts. And the proposition's right to forget is how the free world changes, ladies and gentlemen. Not with a bang, but with an insidious, forgetful silence. Just look at the example of Robert Peston. In 2007, Google informed, the, Google informed the BBC that when responding to search and searches, it wouldn't provide a link to a 2007 blog post by BBC economics editor Robert Peston. Now, this was as alarming as it was puzzling. It only mentions one person. Yes, please? Talking about... Peter Thiel, he's the 1% of the 1%. It's not representative of the whole of society. It's one man. We're talking about millions of people across the world. Surely you can't base your argument on one man. Deputy Presiding Officer, if the Speaker would allow me to continue, the example of Stan O'Neill in this blog post, he was one man who they wrote a blog post about, but it was not deleted because he asked it to be. An ordinary member of the public who left a comment on Mr. Peston's blog asked for it to be removed. Now, surely Mr. Heenan and Mr. Buchan can see how this interference can be manipulated to censor legitimate reporting, add a comment, no thank you, and then demand that it's forgotten. Simple, unadulterated censorship. Now, I would suspect that the powerful, the 1% that Mr. Heenan goes on about, could engage One a small minute. army of their history manipulators to preclude our right to know what happens in our world. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm sorry to have to crush the proposition with a terrible truth that bad people exist. And incredibly enough, 
They don't go around advertising themselves as devious and corrupt. They pretend that they're respectable and virtuous. But tonight's proposition creates a springboard for these people to create their own personal cyber history. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Caitlin and I urge all of you sat here tonight in this bastion of Scottish democracy and civil liberty to oppose this motion that perverts fairness and justice. No one has the right to suppress our past, and it is our responsibility to live with what we have already done. If you don't want to listen to me, then listen to the words of the 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all Wind thy up, tears please. wash out a word of it. I urge you to oppose tonight's motion. Thank you, Finlay, and uh, thank you to all the speakers. Again, we've heard some very interesting views. And I have to say, it's the first time I've ever had to interrupt a poem by Omar Khayyam. <laughs> uh, I'm once again going to open up this debate to the floor, and I'd like to invite everyone to participate, um, as before, for 15 minutes. Um, please raise points in relation to the debate. And like before, if you wish to, please raise your hand if selected. You should wait for the red light to come on in your microphone stand. Tell the chamber your name and the name of the school before you raise your point. Short contributions, the contributions were excellent last time round. I'd like to remind teams that they can choose to answer the point, but that their performance would not be judged against their response. Teams can simply concentrate on constructing their reply, which is of course marked. So may I ask the timekeeper to start the clock, please, and ask for anyone who would like to contribute. Young lady to my right. Hello. I'm Harriet Swatman from the Royal High School. Um, I'm going to make a point to the opposition. Um, they're seeming to make that every single, every single little thing that's been removed from the internet would be something that would be completely life-changing. I think that a lot of the time, the things that have been removed from the internet are things that have been put up accidentally. Now that children have a lot easier access to the internet, and even though people have private accounts, things can be moved, taken off them and moved elsewhere by other people. Um, many things find their way onto the general internet accidentally, and these things should be allowed to be removed if necessary. Things like addresses and phone numbers that were put up accidentally. Young lady, just to my left. Olivia Allardyce, Brace High School. I just, I've got one for the opposition. If you're writing an application form, what do you contain in that application form? You write down your best qualities, your interests, things that define you, make you look the best you possibly can, so you get that job, you get into that university that you've been dreaming of for years. You don't put down your negative th things that might be seen as a weakness, do you? No. So why would you have that on your social media site? Why would you have that online posted about you? That application form defines you to an absolute stranger. So why would you want them seeing as you somebody who's bad when really you've made a couple of silly mistakes? Why would you add that in? You want to seem the best you possibly can so you get that place. Thank you. Sorry, young gentleman here to the left. <laughs> Yes, it was you. It was me that okay, made the sorry mistake, that, not guys. you. Uh, <laughs> it's Cal McLeod from St Aloysius College. The opposition made the point that the powerful would benefit from this legislation, but I see it as it would keep um, even the keel for the ordinary person and individual, Bec because as we've seen, without that, without the ability to remove information in America, in a university where um, students protesting were sprayed by the police, um, and the university is called the police on them, um, they tried, they spent a million pounds to remove this information, um, to try and hide this information of bad publicity about this terrible event. Why, meanwhile, if we allow us, if we allow ourselves to be able to remove personal um, information that would benefit the individual of terrible circumstances, such as reminding of people getting um, 
families and friends getting murdered. This, will be, this would benefit um, society and make it even and do the opposite effect uh, and make the powerful less powerful. Thank you. Young gentleman with the lovely black curly hair. <laughs> uh, we all have skeletons in our wardrobes, but not all of us created of those skeletons, and not all of those skeletons are real. But is it not our duty as a society to allow people to destroy these untruths and lies about themselves by allowing them to forget, be anonymous, and forget things on the internet? Could you give us your name and your school, please? Alex Anahlo from Varal High School. Young gentleman with the black blazer. Thank you. Uh, I'm Angus Walker Stewart from the Royal High. And a couple of years ago, there was a scandal as a couple of people, lots of people, signed in forms to give to charities, donating small amounts of money. But these charities put these forms online and sold them to other organisations. They should be allowed to take these details down as it was not their fault that it was put up there and they did not consent to it being put there in the first place. Okay. Caitlin, you wish to make a response? Um, yes, I would. Thank you. Um, well, just the, the two points that we heard there. Um, both those cases are actually already covered with laws that we have in the UK. Um, what uh, the gentleman over here was talking about was libel. And um, anyone who has libelous comments made against them can have those comments taken down. And um, moreover, the, the gentleman over here was talking about something that was actually breaking the law. And in that case, any information that has been known to break the law is already able to have been taken down from the internet. So what, what, that's not actually what the proposition are um, asking. This is, this is something that's already basic and in, pace, in place. It's sort of the, the internet's bread and butter, if you will. Thank you. Gentleman in shirt sleeves, straight ahead of me. Uh, thank you, Mad uh, Madam Deputy. Uh, my name is Christopher Tienan from St. Aloysius College. And uh, the, the opposition has made the point that the rich and powerful will take advantage of any system that is set up to remove information. But uh, they seem to have omitted the fact that this system, has, the system that is set up currently, has rules and regulations that stops them from taking advantage of these. And no matter how rich and powerful they are, they cannot circumvent the rules that have been put in place. Um, the gentleman sitting beside you, and then the young lady behind Mr. Rennie. Uh, Alistair Lockhart, St. Aloysius College. I'd just like to make the point to the opposition that they've essentially presented the right to disappear from the internet as the end of free speech and civil liberties as we know it. Surely the proposition are only advocating a reasonable control for individuals over their own personal information and data. Do you really expect us to believe that this so-called censorship by having ownership o over our own information will somehow damage our rights? Surely this would only enforce them. Uh, Emma Mackay from Braid High School. Many decisions that people make at one age may be different from the decisions they make years later. I'm sure you and many others in the chamber must regret something that you've done in the past, big or small. If others could find these things online, do you feel that you should be judged for a decision that you made in the past that you now regret? Thank you. Gentleman on the, the left, third row from the back. Um, Christopher McCarthy, St. Aloysius. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy. It's to the opposition. Um, you've given many examples of how the rich and the famous could use this right to like, mask potential wrongdoings. But truthfully, you've not countered the proposition's argument that these are not the majority of people. What about the poorer people in society? The first speaker said, a mistake will only rule your life if you let it. Ironically, this is naivety, because mistakes will damage your integrity, even if it's not their fault. Do these people deserve the right to be forgotten online, since you've clearly forgotten them from your speeches? I think we'll let Caitlin seems desperate to respond quickly, or would you like to take another few points first? Um, well, can I, can I respond, please? Um, can I just come back to the point that we just had? Um, oh, sorry, I'll speak this way because otherwise the microphone won't pick me up. But um, the, your point there about um, the naivety of not letting one mistake define your life. <laughs> In life, a lot of people make a lot of mistakes. And it, is, it seems to me unfair that you can just make all these disappear at the flick of a wand online. Um, it also seems to me that once you let one person, as you said, uh, you, you used the example of uh, taking one whole person down from online. To me, that seems a very dangerous proposition. Uh, it, 
And also, what, the, what you have to remember is that although the proposition said that the rich and powerful would not be able to manipulate this, what we've also got to look at is people who are looking to become rich and powerful and can cover their tracks as they go along. This is something that the proposition haven't thought of and something that I urge you to consider. Oh, gosh, coming thick and fast now. Young lady to my left, and then I have two young ladies to my right. Evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lauren Miller, and I proudly represent Brace High School. I have a question for the opposition team. On most social media sites, there are certain age restrictions. Currently, it is too easy to lie about your age and appear just a little bit younger than you actually are. Kids aren't aware that closing the age gap between you and them is wrong. And before you mention this, many children do so without their parents' permission. Having a younger sister myself, I witness the pressure she feels to follow all of her friends in the latest social media obsession. Do you really believe that it should not be possible for a 10-year-old child, may I stress, a 10-year-old innocent child's information to be removed as he or she grows up? Because I'm pretty sure we are all familiar with the crazy stunts and acts we would perform as a child in order to impress the primary school sweetheart we decided on that morning. I'll take two young ladies here, like young ladies straight ahead of me, and then the one to her left. Natasha Watson, Ray's High School. Opposition, I don't think you are, but I'm aware of a website on the internet. For only $2.50, you can find out every single detail about every single person in the US. Why is this still online? Why hasn't this been deleted? Why are you fighting for things like this to stay on the internet? Amy Hislop, Braze High School. If it's okay, I would like to make a statement and then end with a question. Many companies want to protect their customers as it is a part of their contract, much like the patient-doctor confidentiality a person receives when they go to a hospital. Sometimes it's not the big budget companies or criminals that we need to worry about, it is our governments. A few months ago, the government of the United States of America asked Apple Industries to give them access to every single person who owns an Apple device. Now, I'm not sure if you are aware, but this is a massive break of privacy. If we are not allowed to keep certain aspects of ourselves private, then we might as well let ourselves be spied on like criminals by the very people who think that they are trying to protect us. Thank you. I'm going to let Finlay give a, a quick response. Um, I'd like to quickly address the first and the third point there. The first point about the 10-year-old um, using the internet and using social media. Surely, Deputy Presiding Officer, we should be looking at parental responsibility in the internet when social media websites have clear guidelines that 10-year-olds should not be using them. What a 10-year-old does on the internet, they should not be doing, especially on social media. It is against the law. The law, and there are laws to remove these things. And for the third point about Apple, I believe the exact case was Apple wanted access to the phone of a terrorist. They wanted access to a terrorist's phone to protect American national security. I don't understand how people can be so against stopping national security threats to make sure that more terrorist attacks don't happen. My goodness. One young gentleman in the white shirt, then the young lady in front of him. Three, four, five. Six. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Quick contributions, please. Um, thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. Um, Matthew McVeigh from Nairn Academy. I would just like to put one point to Ross Healan from the proposition. Um, you mentioned that people put information, for example, from relationships online. Um, I would just like to quote um, a friend of mine, and what he said was, the way you can tell a good relationship and a healthy relationship that functions well is that there is no sign of it on social media, and I'm sure you will all agree with me. Because the minute it all falls down into a thousand crumbly pieces, everybody will find out because it then has to be removed and is notified on the website, for example, Facebook. Um, so if you are put, going to put that on, you are running that risk of people knowing online that the relationship has fallen. It's your own responsibility, not the responsibility of the tool, so to speak. Dana Mackay, Bray's High School. I would like to direct my point towards the opposition side. 
Are you not aware of the danger the picture posted on the internet can cause? Many young people have committed suicide because they couldn't handle the painful humiliation they had been put through, Amanda Todd, for example. And often, this isn't the individual's fault. Surely, if somebody wants a photo removed, they should not be denied that right. Where was numbers three and four? <laughs> three, four. Thank you, Madam Deputy. I'd like to make uh, a point to the opposition. You, in response to the Apple, uh, the point made about Apple, you stated that it was sim it was them asking for the uh, access to the phone of a terrorist, but it wasn't just that. The, what they asked for, in fact, was the ability to access the phones of everyone who owns an iPhone. Now. If it was simply just one terrorist, that would be one thing, but it is significantly more than that. They've asked for the ability for, every ta for the access to all iPhones, which is a power that no government should ever have. Can we have your name in school, please? Uh, Christopher Tien, St Aloysius, same as it was before. <laughs> well, do you know what, Christopher? I'm getting on a bit. And I'm finding it difficult to remember the names of my new MSP colleagues, never mind everyone who's just come in here tonight for the first time. <laughs> Our friend to the left. And tell me your name straight away. Uh, Alistair Lockhart, St. Alistair's College. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to give the opposition a bit of a break from the verbal onslaught they've been suffering so far. And I'd like to make a point to the proposition that don't you think that the... Uh, powers to give to personal privacy are surely to the detriment of national defence when terrorists and cyber criminals have to be tracked by law enforcement online. Would you like to respond? I have an earlier point and then okay. I'll respond to this one. Please do. So to respond to your, your point, you said that healthy relationships aren't on social media. But the sad thing is not every relationship is for a start healthy and equally so People take pride in their relationships sometimes. You may have had a bad experience, or your friend has, I don't know. But <laughs> some people do take pride in their relationships, and they want to show the world that you know, they're in love. Because I guess when you're in love, you know, you're kinda, it's like the eye of the storm. You don't really realize what's going on. And sometimes it's not your choice if the relationship was to break up. And so that's where the problem comes from, is when it's not your choice, and you put something on, not realizing what, what it meant at the time, and it comes back to bite you. Don't we just know it, yes. <laughs> I'm going to take presiding officer's prerogative and allow quick contributions from the two that I accepted earlier, please. You remember who you were? Or who you are, whatever. Eve McAmeer, St Aloysius College. You continue to, to the opposition. You continue to state that the motion is in support of the rich and powerful, whereas it is truly supporting the weak and mistreated. An example being the case of the previously mentioned Amanda Todd, a vulnerable teen taken advantage of and bullied into her eventual suicide due to private images leaking without her consent. Do you not agree that many cases like this, and of course Amanda Todd's, could have been avoided had they had the right to be forgotten from the internet? And our last contribution from the floor. Um, the proposition has answered a point of information at the start of the debate saying that any information that could be possibly incriminating, um, and the example was national security with terrorists, couldn't, wouldn't be removed from the internet. But in the case of the young toddler who sadly died at the hands of his mother's abuse, her internet history was used as evidence in court with, with, for searches such as, can you die from a broken leg? Um, no one would have suspected this to be like incriminating evidence at the time. And had she tried to, this would have been removed from her history without any questions being asked. May I have your name in school, please? Sorry, Hazel Sloway, St Morris High School. Thank you all very much uh, for your contributions. We just seem to be heating up there. We could go on a bit longer, but we have to stick to time. So um, I will now ask Finlay Almond to reply on behalf of the opposition. You have three minutes, Finlay. Deputy Presiding Officer, ladies and gentlemen, judges, I'm sure we're all aware from the last 15 minutes that our stance on tonight's motion is not that popular. But we on the opposition do not simply argue this because it would be popular. We argue it because it is right. Tonight's motion states that this House supports the right to, forgotten on, the right to be forgotten online, and it sounds simple, really. It sounds eminently fair. Mr Heenan makes great capital on why we should not be forced to bear our online history with us through our lives like some kind of digital albatross around our necks. 
It's a compelling notion because we all have made mistakes and we all regret our past misdeeds. But just because we can empathize with such a sentiment doesn't mean it's correct and certainly doesn't make it a right. It is my pleasure to sum up the arguments the opposition have made and I would like to begin by taking issue with several flawed points and general sweeping generalizations made by our colleagues across the floor. Both Mr. Buchan and Mr. Heenan have contended that the EU ruling doesn't completely delete information from the internet, therefore not completely forgetting. And I would like to take this opportunity, therefore, because they've been so clearly arguing against the motion in that point, to join us across the floor in opposing tonight's motion. We are under no illusion that the proposition are advertising censorship, however, but we do know that despite their direct quote of it's not about rewriting history, deleting the past and changing it is the direct definition of rewriting history. A further point of clash tonight and picked up in the floor debate is the fear that victims of liars won't be prosecuted. The proposition have made this point away as, uh, as well, and they've clearly not been listening to my speech where I made great points about how there are defamation laws which already exist to get these lies removed. Surely, Deputy Presiding Officer, we must all agree that the free press is a stronghold One minute. of our free speech, and the proposition actually suggested censoring it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, if I've learned one thing from history lessons in school, it's don't trust the internet as a primary source. And if I've learned one thing from PSE lessons, and it might just be one thing, it must be that it is very careful what you put online and guard your digital history of care. Your online activity may be as indelible as a drunken stag party tattoo, but this knowledge is your right. And it is, it is the knowledge that we must be responsible for our actions. And it's a sad reflection on modern life that we believe we have a right to exfoliate any blemish from our past. I don't expect people to be perfect, historically pure paragons of rectitude. And I don't expect online abuse and inaccuracy to go in challenge. But I do have a right to the protection from our state of those who would subvert our society, those who would change our history. And my right to freedom is not subject to Mr. Heenan's wish to forget his past, or subject to a Wind terrorist up, wish to forget their past. And for these reasons, both myself and Caitlin urge you to oppose tonight's motion. Thank you, Finlay. Uh, I now ask Andrew Buchan to reply for the proposition. Ladies and ge gentlemen, judges, deputy presiding officer, Tonight, we've heard two cases. A case on our side about the people in this room, about the general everyday people, the people this motion actually affects. And a debate from the opposition side, which suggests we should focus on the 1%. The 1% of the 1%. The people who realistically do not have the impact on our everyday lives that they suggest they do. The opposition this evening have suggested that what this motion does is take away responsibility. This is simply not the case. Ladies and gentlemen, we all make mistakes. I have made mistakes, my partner has made mistakes, everyone in this room will have made a mistake at some point in their life that they regret. And we're not suggesting that we should not take responsibility for this action. We're suggesting we should take responsibility for this action at the time, not 40 years down the line when an employer tries to Google us. Taking responsibility doesn't have to be something of the future. It's something we do in the present. The opposition have argued tonight one key point, and they have continued to hammer on at this one key point. They claim that this motion is equivalent to censorship, that all it is doing is allowing the rich and powerful a way to subvert us and lie to us. And this is simply not the case. We have told you the legal standpoint behind this right. It's not about deleting history and hiding the truths of the past from the world. It's about allowing everyday people the right to remove past mistakes of their past, to move past mis uh, miscarriages of justice which have occurred against them and live their life and move forward in a way that allows them to achieve the goals they set out for themselves. Now, our opposition in their summation speech there wanted to point out the sweeping generalizations that we on side proposition have apparently made. But they failed to realize the fact that they are making a sweeping generalization themselves. One minute. They are claiming that this motion only serves to allow the rich and powerful to subvert us. And this simply isn't true. 
You've heard from the opposition all the reasons why we should ignore this issue and simply stick with the status quo. The thing is we reject all of those reasons because they are either extreme, inhumane, overdramatic or irrelevant and they all have something else in common. They ignore the fact that it is our responsibility to build a better world and a fairer society for future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, they claim that we shouldn't do this because it's going to be difficult. But if you, like the opposition, lack the fight, the will or the desire, take a deep breath and remember where you are. Remember why you are here. It's because Donald Dewar, a man who longed for a better future for the children of Scotland with their very own parliament, fought in order to achieve that goal. He fought so that we could be standing here today. Let's find strength in the president Wind set up, out by please. Donald Dewar. I'd like to leave you on a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. Then, the next best is the wrong thing, with the worst thing you can do being nothing at all. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't claim to offer the perfect solution, but at least we're trying to do something to solve the problems of the future. And we urge you to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you all very much for your contributions to the debate. Uh, I must now ask the judges to adjourn and decide who will win this year's debating tournament. I would remind them that they have until 9.15 to reach this decision. I would now like to invite the rest of you, the judges aren't having any refreshments, but I'd like to invite the rest of you to join me in the garden lobby for refreshments and a chat and would ask that you all be back seated in the chamber for 9.20. Could I ask those of you on the chamber floor to remain seated until you're instructed to leave by a member of the events team? Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope the judges had sufficient time for their own debate and have reached their conclusion. Uh, I would now like to ask the presiding judge, Mr. John Dye, to offer the adjudication speech. John Dye. Uh, good evening, Deputy Presiding Officer, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Well, what an evening it's been. Um, you know, I'm not a stranger to judging debates and have been doing so for many years. And um, I was reflecting tonight on something that I, I said last year when I was judging the UK school's public speaking final, that sometimes I feel like the Simon Cowell of debating and not that I'm a multi millionaire or that uh, I hang out with Sunita, but that actually I judge people whose talent is far better than mine ever was or ever could be. And um, the same could well be said uh, tonight because we were given a very entertaining night's debating by all of the speakers and indeed all of the, the floor speakers as well. We heard, for, we heard about Andy Warhol actually a few times, um, Omar Khayyam. Senor Gonzalez came up, Robert Peston, Article 8. And thrown into the mix, we got some relationship advice, uh, such that <laughs> Mark McDonald's going home to delete all references to his marriage on Facebook. <laughs> but seriously, it has been an excellent night of debating. And um, both the debates tonight really of the highest quality. It's a cliche, uh, but sometimes cliches are true that uh, regardless of who wins tonight, um, all of the teams tonight should regard themselves as winners. To speak... Um, <laughs> to speak at such a, a, a quality of debate in the, the national debating chamber of, of the Scottish nation is, is no mean feat. Um, some of our MSPs are only learning how to do it. And, um, you know, it really, it really is a tremendous uh, achievement for all of you. you were, you've, you've all been a credit to yourselves, your parents and your schools tonight, so well done.
I always take the applause before I give the result. Um, unfortunately, a high-quality debate uh, means that there's another debate takes place, which I don't enjoy so much, and that's the debate in the judges' chamber. And we had quite a debate tonight. It was a lengthy debate, and I was chivied along a couple of times. And um, it's fair to say it was a very close decision. It was very close. I would like to thank all my fellow judges, Willie, Irene, John and Mark, for helping me come to, to the decision, and it was a very difficult one. Um, before I announce the results, though, I just wanted to give everyone a bit of a flavour of things that kind of informed our decision-making process. Um, we thought about the style and the way people presented themselves, but also the substance. You know, what were they actually saying? Um, not just about asserting, but also about the, the, the analysis of why, if something's wrong, tell us why it's wrong. Um, at the end of the debate, did arguments that were put up at the start, were they standing or had they been knocked down by the other side? How did people perform in the role in the debate, depending on where they were? I could go on, but um, we have heard that Andy Warhol said everyone's got 15 minutes of fame, but I only have five, so I do need to press on. But if the teams do want individual feedback, we, we will be around afterwards. Um, so on, on to the, the bit you really want to know, which is who's won. Um, there was an individual floor speaker prize. And uh, before I announce the results, I do just want to say, um, everyone who I call out, just stay in your seat. You will be called up afterwards to receive your, your prizes. Um, the best uh, floor speaker um, tonight, we had quite a debate about that, but we decided it was one that probably made us laugh the most. And for that, uh, that was Lauren Miller from Braze High. Congratulations to her, but again, thanks to all of the speakers tonight, because you did give us really interesting contributions and you helped the debate along. So on to the main event, um, second place and then the winners. Um, just to reiterate, it was very, very close tonight and all the teams, regardless of where they come, should, should just be very proud of, of, uh, of their, uh, their contributions tonight. But in second place, the, the judges eventually decided that uh, second place tonight was Braze High. But in first place in the winners of the 2016 Law Society of Scotland Donald Dewar Memorial Debating Competition is Nairn Academy. Thank you very much, John. We will now hear from Lorna Jack, Chief Executive of the Law Society of Scotland, who will deliver a vote of thanks. Thank you, Lorna. Deputy Presiding Officer, ladies and gentlemen, judges and competitors, good evening. I am thrilled to be here and to witness the fascinating and frankly entertaining final of the Donald Dewar Memorial Debating Tournament. This year has once again seen Scotland seek to hear the voices, views of young people with 16 and 17 year olds having had the right to vote in the Scottish elections last month. Young people in Scotland now more than ever have the opportunity to shape their own future, to debate critical issues facing their country and to see the impact of their contributions. So it's fabulous to see so many young people participating in an event like our debating tournament now in its 18th year. It showcases an appetite for confronting complex issues and an impressive ability to apply skills and knowledge to really engage with those issues. I'm, I know I'm not alone in congratulating all our competitors throughout the tournament for being truly inspiring. <laughs> Let me remind you just how tough the road has been for our competitors to reach this final tonight. Last November, 128 teams argued for and against the motion, this house believes the internet does more harm than good. During the 32 opening heats held in schools across Scotland. 
In round two, 64 teams from the opening rounds went on to debate this House believes that compensation should be paid for the injustices of past generations. Just 16 teams then went on to compete in the semi-finals in March. This was where the competitors' skills and resourcefulness were truly tested as each team's motion was only revealed one hour prior to the debate. Our competitors were subjected to considerable time pressure, in addition to not being able to use any phones, computers or books to prepare their arguments. So I'm sure you'll agree that reaching this final is a tremendous achievement in itself, and that the four teams here this evening are more than deserving of their places. So many of you contributed, contributed to the floor debate this evening. I want to congratulate you for taking part, in, and in particular our prize winner, Laura, Lauren Miller, who also made me laugh, although I was alarmed to begin with, I have to say. Every year the floor debate seems to get livelier, and we rely on you to challenge our debaters, so thank you for your input. Perhaps we'll see you in front of the judges in future years. It is wonderful to be able to host the final in the debating chamber of the Scottish Parliament. Speaking in this chamber is a very special experience. And whether there's a right to be forgotten or not, I am sure it's one that you will all choose to remember for a very long time. On behalf of the Law Society and all of our guests here this evening, let me thank the Deputy Presiding Officer, Linda Fabiani, MSP, and everyone in the Parliament's event and education teams, particularly Graeme Donoghue, Douglas Miller and Mary Hershaw, for ensuring to that tonight has been such a resounding success. Thank you. <laughs> Sitting in the gallery are the team's supporters whose commitment should not be underestimated. The teachers and parents of our debaters, the coaches who have challenged and supported the teams here this evening. It is your enthusiasm and hard work that has encouraged your pupils' success. I'm sure you are very proud of them tonight. Also in the gallery are our judges from earlier heats and semi-finals and without whom, put simply, we would not have a tournament. Every year we rely on over 100 volunteers to judge in the opening rounds and this year, as indeed every year, we've seen fantastic levels of support. It's down to your commitment to play a part that we see schools able to participate year after year. And I'm delighted to tell you that this year, schools in 28 of Scotland's 32 local authorities took part. That's an enormous achievement. Thank you so much for your involvement and we do hope that you've enjoyed it. Let me now turn my attention tonight to tonight's judging panel. I certainly did not envy your task of selecting our winners from this very talented group of finalists that we've had before us. Once the event draws to a close, we would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation for the fantastic job you've done tonight. And you'll be delighted for those of you who've been here before to hear that it's not chocolates tonight. <laughs> so thank you, John, Irene, John, Mark and Willie. Thank you very much. Again this year, we are fortunate to have our tournament sponsor by, sponsored by Hodder Gibson, the publishers. We're also most grateful to the Glasgow Bar Association for donating the second prize. And I'm delighted that Peter Dennis from Hodder Gibson has joined us tonight and will join our, our president, Ailey Wiseman, to present the prizes. Thank you for your continued support, which each year helps ensure that pupils across Scotland have the opportunity to compete in this tournament. Please indulge me for a second in thanking my colleagues at the Law Society and in particular Katie Cameron, who has very much been the leader of Team Debate this year. Katie has worked enthusiastically coordinating judges, schools, teachers, sponsors to ensure that the tournament can run and schedule. Katie, I know that you will be happy to see the months of your work come to fruition, although I'm sure you will join your colleagues, coaches and teams in looking forward to the excitement that will be the 2017 tournament after you have your well-deserved summer break. Finally, I would like to turn our attention back to our runners-up and our winners. I know you'll agree that they have faced some seriously impressive competition tonight, so you should feel especially proud, Ross and Andrew of Brace High being the runners-up, and most important, important, Caitlin and Finlay from Nairn Academy crowned our champions this year's. Congratulations once again to you all. 
Now, our teams will be keen to be reunited with our coaches, parents and friends, so I will hand back over to the Deputy Presiding Officer to present the prizes. Thank you all to everyone who's been involved, and I hope to see many of you here again next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorna. And of course, another thanks to all our wonderful judges for their time in this debate. Uh, we now move to the, the presentation of the prizes. And I'm delighted to announce that all the finalists will receive a commemorative quake for their efforts, as well as a book token. Do you all know what a quake is? <laughs> yeah? Good. <laughs> the winner of the best floor speech will receive a £50 book token. The runners-up and the winning team will share £500 worth of books from the educational range supplied by Hodder Gibson. The runners-up will receive the second prize of £250 towards their debating society, courtesy of the Glasgow Bar Association. And the winning school will receive £1,000 towards their debating society and, of course, they'll receive the all-important tournament trophy. Theirs for one year. So you have to look after it very carefully. May I ask Ailey Wiseman, President of the Law Society of Scotland, and Peter Dennis of Hodder Gibson Publishers, sponsors of the tournament, to come to the floor of the chamber for the prize giving. Please. Prize table. Now, I hope I get this order right. They've written it down for me very, very carefully. And I hope you guys hand out the right prizes. <laughs> Can I first of all ask, please, Lauren Miller of Brays High, winner of the best floor speech, to come forward and receive that prize. Can I now invite both the Royal High School and St. Morris's High School to come forward and receive their prizes? May I now invite the runners-up, Braes High School, to come forward and receive the prizes.
Oh, there's something else, isn't there? <laughs> Can I now ask, please, for our winners near an academy to step forward and receive their prize as winners of the 2014-15 Donald Dewar Memorial Debating Tournament. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I've just been told that I lost a year. I'm trying to stay away from my 60th birthday. There'll be a lot of people up there that'll understand that. <laughs> the 2015-16 Donald Dewar Memorial Debating Tournament. Winner. What a wonderful smile Caitlin has there. Everybody look at Caitlin's smile. She's so happy. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. You should all be very, very proud of your contributions this evening. And, of course, as we've already heard, what, a, what an achievement to reach the final of such a prestigious competition as this. Just fantastic. Uh, well done, everyone who took part. Well done, all those who were in the final and well done particularly the winners of our competition. May I please ask those who will be staying for the official photograph to remain in the chamber and to all our other guests, may I say thank you, good night, and I wish you all a safe journey home. Good night.